Eight simple rules for a better overall rank. I decided to write some rules down to get better at FPL. And what better way of getting better than to bring on better managers than myself to chat about my rules. Today we have Holly, our fantasy football community. Hi Holly, how's it going? Hi Dave, I'm good, thank you. I'm excited for the new season and I'm excited to be on, so thank you very much for the invite. You're very welcome. There's a a bunch of elite managers doing this mini-series and I couldn't not get you on. I was about to go text Ben, but I thought, oh, better of it, you know. (laughs) (laughs) So You've got the best fantasy weekly panellist on. There you go, exactly. So how have you been? Yeah, good. Um, I mean, the start of the season... It's just tricky this year, isn't it? I feel one. like there's always a lot of variables at the start of the season, but this season more than ever, there's more, and especially when you've got COVID, you've got blank game week one. Um, we've got probably a tricky end to the season as well because of the lack of flexibility in the schedule. Like it's just going to be a tough ride, I think. And it's going to be interesting, but I'm excited for the challenge. Like surely. Us that are taking fantasy really seriously should prevail over the more casual manager. Hopefully. Hopefully. I mean, this, <laughs> the, the, that is why we've made the rules hard. This is what we're doing. This is the whole thing. I love that you've, you've, you've hit the nail on the head, though. You've said that this is going to be such a weird start to the season, which is obviously not the perfect time to then bring a set of rigid rules and set them down ready to go. But I feel like I've just been so casual in my thinking over the past couple of years. I really wanted to sit something down in stone to kind of follow and find out the type of manager that I really am. So are you up for uh, dissecting my rules for me? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully I'll learn a bit along the way as well. Oh, that'd be amazing. I don't think that'll ever happen, but I think it'd be really good. <laughs> All right, rule number one, no hits. So a simple one to start off with, as few as possible, at least. Uh, obvious caveats being injuries or suspensions. And uh, the main thing to hit, 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 hit home here is no hits to make up for bad planning. So what is your experience with hits over the last couple of seasons? Well, when I started playing FPL, I was a bit trigger happy with the hits. Um, and never taken like ridiculous amount of hits, um, in one go, but I would tend to make a minus four more often than not most weeks. And since I've reined the hits in, I feel like I've been doing a lot better as, as an FPL manager. But I think, I think the caveat this season is going to be that with the blank game week one, And with the desire to, you know, hold that first wild card as long as possible, I think a couple of consecutive weeks of of minus four, game week two, three, four, to avoid having to use an early wild card could could be quite valuable. I I think hits are better off either right at the very start of the season where there's that obvious advantage of getting on board the form players early before they go up in price and, and gain a bit of team value. And then when we've got blanks and doubles, I think that's fine. But just on an average week, just just because you can or because you're bored to go for that minus four probably isn't the best strategy to have. Or you're drunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I struggle a little bit with when I give drunk Dave the the reins. Um but you're so you agree that like basically um it's gonna be difficult to find a manager that doesn't agree that taking no hits is a good or uh, trying to aspire to no hits is a good idea. But I do like your caveat of this year at the very early stages of the game, we need to start kind of thinking about taking maybe one or two just so that we can keep that wild card in case COVID strikes or, you know, we wanna try and attack those doubles close. I think it's game week 18 19 Ben Crowland said so um there's a lot of reasons to hold it are you planning on on holding it for a specific time or are you just going to try and hold it for as long as possible right now it's as long as possible unless something pops up in the meantime where I think I'm, I'm way off the template or way off what I want my team to look like and I need to make a load of changes I think for now the plan is to go as long as possible without using that wild card but it, it's going to be difficult. I always wildcard around the first international break. Mm-hmm. And the only season I didn't, I had my worst season by a mile. Yeah. So you've got to find a compromise somewhere, haven't you? So that that's the plan, but it's not a rigid plan. Okay. So so rule number one, no hits. We're going to say that's a maybe then. Maybe no hits, but it is a weird start to the season. All right. Okay, cool. Um, Right, pause there because it's fucking raining like shit and I can hear it, which means my mic can hear it. So I'm gonna call Yeah, it. I was going to say I heard it and then had to have a little look out the window to see whether it was my washing getting wet. Bloody Scotland. <laughs> All right. 
All right, rule number two, have a core team with price points. So this is based on uh, listening to FFS Joe, um, Scout Joe talks about having balanced price points for each position, which means you can easily navigate to any player on your team um, or any player in the game within two moves. Uh, it's an assumption that your picks at the start of the season will need changed at some point, which allows you the most flexibility you could possibly have to start the season. Now, obviously, this is a start of the season type rule, but what is your uh, what's your take on price points this season? I've never ever embraced this price points thing before, mm -hmm. but this season I'm, I'm going for it with the price points because I think it's going to be so important that you can easily hop on and hop off players when they're coming into form or when they've got a good balance of fixtures on hop off. And I think the other thing is formation as well. Having that flexibility with being able to change formation is going to be really important as well. Now, the difficult thing for me is that I'm wanting to do the price points, mm -hmm. but then I look at where I want to spend on premium players and it's in the midfield. And then it, it basically gives me like a Danny Ings or a Ralph Jimenez as my highest priced forward at 8.5. Right. But what I'm trying to get my head around over the next few days is trying to start the season with two premium defenders three-ish premium midfielders counting Bruno in there and then one premium-ish forward in Danny Ings and I can do that and have one million in the bank spare as well. Wow, you're putting a million in the bank to start yourself off with. Yeah, so I'm, I'm like my draft as it stands is currently I'm not I'm not committed to a formation. Um, I'm definitely not going to play three up top from the off. Right. But I've got a million in the bank, so I could easily move to three, three up top easily. Right, okay. It's kind of like a maybe a four four two slash three five two, depending on what sort of mood I'm in and who's got the fixtures. Mm -hmm. But it's not rigid, so I've got those price points covered, and I've got money in the bank as well. So I've got a four million defender, a five million midfielder, and a four point five million striker. But in one move, I can commit to a formation whether that be 343 three or 352 three, um because i don't really know which i want at the moment and i feel like i need more information um obviously that transfer window is still open until the 5th of october so what looks great on paper when we start the season on the 12th of september may not be the case by the time we get to that first international break yeah that's that's a really good point actually. I like the fact that you're kind of holding money. I never I've I've never even thought about doing that. I know I'd done it once beforehand and it worked in my favor, but it wasn't it wasn't really because I wanted to spend all the money. It was just because like I, I had a good team and I was happy with it and then therefore also I had 0.5 in the bank, but doing it on purpose because of that flexibility is another level of this to add to this rule of price points. Like not only do you have a good spread of premiums and kind of mid-range players, but you've also got a million in the bank. I've never thought of that. Hmm. I mean, it's awful. Like, when would you ever start the season with money in the bank? You get a hundred no, million, you spend it. But this season, I just, I just think it, it, it'll be really, really valuable because even like if you've got no money in the bank, if one of your players goes down 0.1 and someone mm -hmm. at the same price goes up 0.1, you're already two moves away from getting them. Yeah, whereas you are zero, you 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 can still do it in one. Hmm, mm, I like that. So so you're fully endorsing the price points this season as well. So we're on yeah. the same page there. I, I do feel like I need to do a little bit more research, and it, it takes a lot of discipline. And I don't know if I'm disciplined enough. Well, I feel like you're still you're wavering a little bit already with your three premium midfielders. That's a little bit that's a little bit heavy for me. I've got I think I've got two and then a wee seven million and a wee five five million. Um and those are my price points and I can pretty much get to anyone. But you're you're pushing it, I think, a little bit. Yeah, it's that it's that Bruno on the bench that I've currently got for game week one, but I know if I don't have him in game week one, I'm not gonna have him in game week two. Yeah, it's hard. It's a hard yeah. one. Yeah, I was looking today on um, Fantasy Football Scout point projections. for. <laughs> uh, they've got six game projections on the members area. And I think Bruno is third. Um, so there's only two players that are expected to get more FPL points than him over the opening six game weeks. And he's only got five games. 
Like the fixtures are so good. I know I really should have Bruno in my team by game week two. At least, at least Bruno. Yeah, exactly. So if I've got Bruno in there game week one, I've definitely got him for game week two. And I've got the flexibility of bringing in another United attacker if they impress me early doors. Right, okay. Well, we're on the same page with that. So um, let's move on to see about captain. So rule number three, simple captain choices. No outside the box captain, stick to the premiums and go with the majority of managers unless there are multiple options presented. What do you think? I know you had a little bit of um, trouble with your captains last year. Yeah, and I, w- I was going with simple captain choices and mainly the popular captain choices. The 2018-19 season, I went with the popular captain choices and they pretty much nailed it every week. And I finished mm-hmm. just outside the top 5k that season and captaincy yeah. was a massive contributing factor to that. Last season, 2019-20, there was a number of weeks where the top captained player blanked particularly yeah. early on in the season and it was awful it was and that's the thing like I can look back at my captaincy through the season and it was mainly like Salah, Sterling, KDB, Aubameyang just like the obvious names but it's just a lottery captaincy for me and I, yeah I do agree that you go with the premium players and you probably go with the home fixtures as well and keep it simple but there's no guarantees it's going to work. I think I think the last season was a very big outlier because I remember eighteen mm. nineteen. We got to like nineteen game weeks or something, didn't we? Where mm. it was consistently the top polled player was the one who who hauled. It made it a lot easier. It means you didn't really have to think about it. Whereas last year, even though you weren't, you were doing the exact same thing, and I did it too. The only difference being between the two years is that it was always wrong so it made made us feel like we were always wrong when I don't think we were I think you're absolutely right like I kept captaining the players that I think was the obvious pick and I wasn't trying to be a maverick or anything but then when I see managers like late riser who is captain in martial getting hat tricks all the time and stuff like that like I I can't help but think I want to do that too but you have to be kind of true to yourself a little bit and say it's like you know there's no way you're going to be able to pick a good captain so just go with the flow and that's where i am right now i'm not good i don't think i'm good enough at, at finding like you know that weird vardy pick when everyone else is picking Mane or something do you know what i mean yeah so i'm just I... trying to write this rule down to stay true to myself and be like yeah you, you're not going anywhere mate just stick with salah <laughs> yeah exactly and if you go with the most captains and they're blank it's a shield you're sticking with the pack aren't you? you're not dropping too far back if if it yeah. If it doesn't come off, whereas if you go Maverick, and I, I like looking back at my FPL history, I, I couldn't really tell you like a single week where I went rogue and, and benefited from it. I think I'm, I'm still going to ch- choose simple captain choices, and hopefully, as you say, it was just an outlier last season. Okay, awesome. Rule number four we've talked about it a little bit already, but wildcard with a plan. So, wildcarding without just hating your team using that as a an excuse to wild card is what i have done the past two seasons and my first wild card is always rubbish because of it so this year i've decided to write a rule to try and keep me on the straight and narrow or to have like a basic plan so have a game we can mind when i'm looking to wild card don't try and use it willy-nilly you know and try and time my wild card with a fixture swing or an international break or something like that. So that was what I wrote down, but I actually wrote that plan down before we learned of the blanks and all that stuff. So yeah. it's a bit of a difficult one, but what is your, I know we talked about it already, but what, what your plan is to just ignore it completely. Yeah, basically I'm going to pretend that I haven't got a wild card, which will probably be easier to do once we've got past that first international break. Mm-hmm. It, it's one of those though, where, if you have a good start to the season, you don't really need the wild card. Like mm-hmm. I think back to um, 2018-19, which was one of my best seasons. I was in the top 50k after four game weeks. And I did actually choose to play my wild card, but I kept all my premium players and just moved around like those little fillers, like the yeah. third striker, the fourth midfielder, the fourth and fifth defenders. Um, I think I only made five transfers. Um, I just needed it just to, because, you know, you, you end up with an odd point four there that you think's a bit of a waste and, and all the funds add up at the end of the day. But mm-hmm. if you get off to a good start this season, 
I'll, I'll probably feel like oh, I don't need the wild card. But if I'm ranked, you know, a millionth or, or worse, two millionth at, at the, that first international break, it will be hard not to wild card. But I do like your idea of wild carding with a plan. I've never sort of rage wild carded before. And right. certainly while the chips have, have been in the game, it, it's been obvious when to use the second wild card in conjunction with the chips. And the first wild card in that first international break has always been the most appealing time to but do see, it. But that's see, a, that's a plan in, in, in of itself. You have just said there, look, if I'm hitting rank 1 million, 2 million by game week four, then I'll think about using it. But that is a that is a plan. You have written yeah. yourself a plan, regardless of whether that is something that you want to do. Like that's not your route A. Route A is pretend you don't have one. But you've at least got a plan B, which is if I'm doing shite, Dave, then I'm I'm gonna <laughs> use it. But that that is not something that I've ever done. I've never thought like if I'm basically what happens is, oh I'm doing shite I'm going to use it this week. Oh, maybe this week's not the greatest. I'll, I'll do it next week. And then next week comes, but I've had a little bit of a better week. So I'll be like, oh no, I'll do it next week. And that's what I'm trying to cut out. So at least you've got a, let's reassess at game week four. If I need to use it, if my rank is X, then I'm going to use it. It's never a case of, oh, my team is shocking this week. I'm just going to do it. So I like <laughs> that. So you kind of instinctively already have a plan A and B for your wild card. Yeah, I guess the other factor for me at the moment is time. And if there's an international break, I've actually got the time to think about it. Whereas if it's like a midweek deadline. Yeah. And there's like two, two days between one, one lot of fixtures finishing and the next starting. I've not got the time to think about it. I physically have not got time to think through that wild card. And I know I'll, I'll make stupid decisions. And there was a lot of managers, um, the season just gone that saved their wild cards and then had to like wild card on like boxing day or something ridiculous oh, like yeah, that. I remember that. Two um, days between Christmas and Exactly. Yeah. And they struggled because they they didn't have the time to think about it properly. Yeah. Um so that just shows as well. Like sometimes there may be a better time to wild card than an international break, but if you know you've got the, the time and the headspace to think about it properly then, um it's something you've got to consider. It, it, like FPL is is something that you need to fit in around real life. And I know yeah. a lot of us have had a lot of time on our hands over the last few months, but oh, yeah. it's not always the case, Dave. <laughs> no, I can't wait to go back to work. You'll and, be like, well, I might as well use this wild card before I go back to work. <laughs> That's true. See if they say, right, you're furloughing after the first international break. It's going to be very difficult for me to, you know, come <laughs> come to work with a wild card. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're right. Okay. We'll stop it there. I think we're doing quite well. We're kind of pretty much agreed on most points. Although I did like your caveat of the whole cold in a million. So you're you're pretending that you have no wild card and you're pretending you only have 99 million to spend. I like it. Right, yeah. we'll stop there and uh, we'll hear a little message from our sponsor. What's happening, mate? Finally up in Scotland. So good to see you. How was your trip? Oh, trip was all right. I'm gasping for a cuppa. Yeah, man. Just chuck your, uh, chuck your jacket in there. You want a tea or a coffee? Well, what mugs do you have? Wait, what? What mugs do I have? Yeah, what receptacles are on offer? Eh, uh, just normal ones? I've only got normal mugs. Ah, oh, it's just, I've got this mug back at home. It's exclusively for elite FPL managers. I uh, got it from FPL Merch's Kickstarter campaign, which is currently going on at the moment. And like I say, it's tailored for managers who have had a great 1920 FPL season. So you don't you want... don't you don't have one of those. Just want to be clear well, here. No, I don't. I you're don't. not you're not an elite manager. I know I'm a normal fucking person, mate. Do you want a coffee or not? Oh, I think I'll leave it. Actually, cheers. Rule number five, Holly: template team to start. So this is similar to rule number two, having a core team with price points, but this is specific to core team versus differentials in your team. So my core team and differentials are going to be differentials that have proven themselves in the Premier League. I'm not going to be looking at fringe players that um, are new or anything like that. I'm going to be waiting a few weeks to see who is actually nailed. And I'm going to try and make sure that my template team is something that I can keep for as long as possible. I'm not going to try and um, pencil in transfers early and, and, and things like that. Um, what are your thoughts on the template word? When you say template, do you mean like the Twitter template, the FPL community template, or the actual 
team selected by percentages on the website? I think they all come into it for me. When I'm looking at my team, at, like last season when I started, I picked some absolute shockers just because I thought that they were going to do well. It was way too risky. So this rule is really to stop risking players, to have a template team to start being, you know, six or seven core players that are proven in the Premier League and maybe three players that are uh, that are outliers, but not so much outliers. Yeah, and I think to start with, if, if you're looking at like the main starting 11 that you're going to use week in, week out, which which probably for the most part is, is going to be a pool of, of maybe nine players because you might have a bit of rotation in and out on your bench. Mm-hmm. You kind of want seven of those to be over 10% owned with maybe three or four of them over 25% owned. But yeah. then you can look at like the selected by percentages on the Premier League website at the moment and some of them are just ridiculous. Um, <laughs> Go shout some out. You'll see some in the past though, like if you if you're playing FPL a few seasons ago, like <laughs> game week one, Wayne Rooney was always fifty percent owned. Yeah. Even when he moved to Everton and he was too old. Declining. <laughs> um but like you look KDB, thirty nine percent ownership currently. Not got a game in game week one. Yeah. I th- I I'm not looking r- right now. As of this day that we're recording, I don't care about percentage owned because it's not something that is uh, a, an actual reflection of, of the ownership of serious players. A lot of those are going to be people that made their team and aren't looking at it again until a day before or something. Like, I don't mind that so much. But I know myself, like, Salah's going to be highly owned. Bruno's going to be highly owned. Kevin De Bruyne is going to be highly owned at some point in the season. Do you know what I mean? Right. So, so I'm trying to yeah. steady myself. So what, what are your splits between, you know, sh- swords and shields for your team? Um, it it's trying to get in those the the right balance of premium players, and then the having a few of the highly owned, mid priced and budget players, and a couple of differentials in there. But yeah, I absolutely agree with all that you've said, and I try and avoid players from the new players to the league yeah. that are transferred in from elsewhere because other than Salah and Bruno Fernandez in the last three seat and um, Aubameyang. No one's really hit the ground running like they haven't. And, and there's probably for every one gem, there's there's another 10 that don't really do a lot. And the promoted side, you never really know what you're going to get from them. I guess the exception for me at the moment is I've got Mitrovic in my side. But Fulham have been in the Premier League before. They're arguably a better side than the last time they are in the Premier League. And Mitrovic has played a good few minutes in the Premier League before and has scored goals in the Premier League before so he's one that I'm I'm happy to take a gamble on but I wouldn't want like four or five players that are new to the Premier League either because they're from mm. a promoted side or, or, or just new to the league in general in my game week one squad. Yeah, totally agree. What is your split then? Uh, how many How many players are kind of differentials in your team just now versus, you know, just price points or, or decent picks? I don't think I've got really got any differentials in my squad right now. Having See, a look that's through. what I'm aspiring to get to. That's what I'm talking about. Because I can't help but try and be a little bit maverick on one or two positions. Yeah, I mean, I've got like Suchek at the moment, who's like 8%. He's probably the lowest. And I don't even think he would be a differential. He's a cover player for game week one, right? So it's not even a big deal. Yeah. Because he's going to be on your bench most of the yeah. time. Yeah, Kyle Walker-Peters, that's it. Yeah. So so 9-2, and two, basically, I would say, for game week one. A 9-2 yeah. split. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very similar to a lot of other managers that I've spoke to. So I think I think that rule's a big tick. Yes, template team to start. Don't go too crazy. Um, and see how you get on, and then kind of wait a couple of weeks and try and yeah. bring in form. And players. I also wouldn't um triple up on a team for game week one because it it's a big risk, and you've also got to consider that if you don't get the right three, even if they are a team that starts with a bang, if you've not got the right three then you're gonna to have to spend two transfers to get the right three in so like mm. i know even like in project restart people had like rashford and and decided they wanted greenwood or, or the other way and you you know trying to move around different players in different positions and and yeah. like it's not easy well, i'm gonna to have to rethink my arsenal players then yeah <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, okay, cool. Rule number six, minimal goalkeeper transfers. This is a pretty easy one that I've chucked in here. Um, just in case, 
because sometimes I do think, oh, I've got two free transfers. I don't really want to use them. I don't really see anything else to do. You know what? I'll just change my keeper because he's not got the best fixtures going forward in the next six, right? Don't do that. That is what this rule is there to tell me to. Goalkeepers are for the long haul, 10 game weeks or more, and any transfers transfer with them should be used in your wild card or nothing. What do you think? Yeah. Unless you've got a transfer to literally burn. But even then I've done it before and it I've ended up shooting myself in the foot. It's just it's just not worth it. Like Yeah. There was about five weeks last season that I didn't own Nick Pope and then I brought him straight back in at the earliest opportunity. That's so another, yeah. you are you and so many other people that I've spoke to have said the exact same thing. I had Pope took him out, brought him back. Yeah, in. I, I think there was Pope two games last year. I totally should have. <laughs> there was like two games in a row when Burnley like conceded four goals, and I was like, get him out, get Dean Henderson, and then literally like five weeks later, played my wild card first name back on the sheet. Pope didn't look back. Yeah, so it's it's a case of just having the keeper and 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 running them to the ground until there's literally no other option than take them out that's that's what that rule is so i guess we're all in favor then considering yeah. that pope antidote yeah easy one perfect all right number seven no team bias so that's difficult in practice for a lot of managers it's not something that i've ever came across because i only support scottish teams um so it's really easy for me but do you support any teams in the premier league well, I do have Manchester United as my uh, fan team on there, so <laughs> I have got a little bit of a bias. Um, okay. Obviously, Hull City haven't been in the Premier League for quite a few seasons now, oh, I know. and aren't even a league away. So um, it was it was easy when um, when Hull City was in the league because their assets basically weren't worth owning anyway. But um, like the season they were in the Premier League, I did have a season ticket at Hull and. I kind of got a, I kind of had a little bit of a bias if if I was going to go, you know, watch them play against Chelsea. I was like, get a Chelsea player in. Captain Chelsea player. <laughs> so you'd bet against your team. I love that. Yeah, but a lot of a lot of people do that. Either either they'll have a bias towards their team, or a bias against their big rivals, or bias against the opposition that their team's facing in in, in a game week, and it, it it's hard. What would you? What would your advice be to someone listening who does have that bias in them that they're they'll never get a Tottenham player, or they've got three West Brom players and they can't they can't see any reason why not to? And I've I've seen some arguments on Twitter where Leeds fans are adamant that their their first couple of fixtures, or sorry, that Leeds fans are adamant that they're they're actually not a bully team they're not like a a team that can get pushed around that everyone's talking about them as being a good fixture and they're they're raging about it so what would you how would you kind of curb that that bias if someone was asking you i mean i just say just don't have a bias and put all those club biases aside and and, and think logically but then the caveat to that ben crabtree big everton fan hates Liverpool, never had a Liverpool player in his FPL squad. He won the whole thing yeah. like three or four seasons ago. I feel like that's going to work once <laughs> for one person. I think he's got it. That'll yeah, never happen it again. Worked. It did work though. So so because it worked once, that's you. You don't like the rule. <laughs> no, but <laughs> oh, it joking. worked spectacularly. And you don't know yeah. all the other stories of all the other managers that have ever finished in the top 1K, for example. Like, yeah. but having a bias against the big club like that, it does make things easier because, like, say at the moment, if you're if you're not wanting any Liverpool players, you'd be like, well, I can have Aubameyang, I can have a couple of, you know, Man City attackers, I can have a few Man United attackers. Like, yeah, it it can work. So, I think if you're adamant and you you follow the same rule for the whole season, and you know that you're not going to be able to get away with those biases, then then do it. But from a week to week, once you've set out those guidelines or, you, or you're setting out not to have a bias, you need to stick with it. Yeah. Like, I know, you, I know it's okay for you, Dave, but you'll know when you're writing down that list of rules whether you can stick to that no team bias or not. And if you can't, then just don't write it down. I like that. It's also something that I've not considered before uh, on this in this mini-series, and that's that there is a difference between having three players from your favorite team or just not producing any players from from a team that you don't like and and i think you're right in saying that if you just eliminate one of the top four sides 
it makes every transfer a little bit easier because you don't have to consider them. You've got so much money to spend elsewhere. It means I can have three City players without worrying about Salah because I've already told myself I'm never bringing him in, so it doesn't even matter. So my mm. bet is against him for an entire season, and I don't need to kind of jump on, jump off, and, and hope for the best. So that's actually, it probably makes it a lot easier. It might not make it um, more profitable, you might mm. not do as well, but it certainly does make the, the, the decisions easier. And that's the whole point. We're trying to not overcomplicate FPL. We're trying to simplify it and not overthink. And that is a good tactic. So there might be something in that. <laughs> oh, you keep making me think in this episode, mate. I don't well, know. Well, <laughs> I have to disagree with one of you roles. Just, uh, just to make right, it I'm seem fair. Right, I'm here now for everyone listening. I'm not bringing West Brom players in no matter what, okay? <laughs> that book can't, babe. Um, all right, last rule. Um, no mini league focus. This is something that again was chucked in as a last rule, just in case someone needed to hear it. And I also wanted to hear your thoughts on it. So countering mini league is a bad practice. Looking at the person below you or in front of you and trying to work transfers in for to, to defeat that one manager um, isn't going to help you get a better overall rank. And that's what we're here for, isn't it? So if your goal is to win your mini league, then fair enough. That's a good goal. Stick to that. Um, but if your goal is to get highest overall rank you can, then don't let your competition in your mini leagues in, in, infect your decisions. What do you think? Yeah, well, it's easy for me because I play for overall rank. So I, I always I always tend to do pretty well in mini leagues anyway. But I think if I concentrate on the overall rank, then the mini leagues will take care of themselves. But... Mm -hmm. If you are ranked in the top 10 overall, and it's fairly condensed going into the final few game weeks, mm -hmm. that's effectively the same as a mini league then, isn't it? That's true. And that's in true. that position, would I be playing my own game or would I be looking at what others have been doing or what they're likely to do? And I can tell you which side of the line I'd fall on. So... There are exceptions. I mean, the chances of me being ranked in the t within the top 10 or the top 5 with with a few game weeks to go are slim. Yeah, but you're totally right. But Magnus Carlsen was in that exact position. I think he was fourth or third last season, the last game week. And everyone looked at his team once the game week started and was like, what the hell is he doing? He's done so many weird transfers. He took out big hitters. He brought in underliers, blah, blah, blah. But he was trying to counter the few people that were in front of him because he was either I'm going to win or I'm going to come 10th. But I'd rather try and win than than nothing. And he 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 basically countered his mini league of of the top ten. So you're absolutely right. Uh, it didn't pay off for him. But you're totally right. So so looking for that caveat for this rule, it would be you know if we're close to the end, and there's a few different things that you want to achieve, like yeah. top one. <laughs> I mean, like I don't do cash leagues or anything like that, and then like I'm never really that bothered on mini leagues. But I'd, I guess I've never really been. I, I do like a lot of leagues in the community where there's a lot of people in. So, so you're roughly near the top, but not the top. And then yeah. like the friends and family leagues, it's just, well, it's a given that I win every season. <laughs> <laughs> brush, brush, wink, wink. <sighs> yeah. It's like if yeah. anyone's within a hundred points, then they've done well. So yeah, that, I guess. And I know there's a lot of, I know cash leagues aren't technically allowed anymore and, and, and all of that stuff, but yeah. For me, it's always the overall rank. But for, I mean, for a lot of people that play FPL, it is all about the mini leagues. And then in that situation, if that's what I played it for, then then absolutely I, I would look at what other people are doing. I wouldn't be able to help myself. But yeah, as it stands for me, I just have that blind faith that um, I can be a better manager than than friends and family that I'm in a league with. And, and I'll get there and overtake them by by playing my game. Yeah, I I think that's you've 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 definitely condensed the whole rule into I am going to be better than them if I just do my own thing. So I just have to believe in myself. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean we believed in Santa for years, so we can believe in ourselves for like one season. Do you know what, what I mean? You, what, what are you Don't Dave? you start? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's what all the rules, Holly. Is there anything that I have missed? Anything that you hold dear to yourself that you do every single season that I have just not included? I think mine would maybe centre around the timing of transfers and not oh, making really? early transfers. Right, so waiting for the information from all the all the chat as opposed to doing it, you know, Sunday night. Yeah, exactly. Traditionally, I make my transfers on a Friday night. 
I think I quite like the rule change with the change in deadlines because for real life purposes, it is better now that you don't need to be on Twitter an hour and a quarter before the game week deadline to, to get team leaks because then it, it, it becomes a little bit unhealthy, doesn't it? And you have to properly be on it to benefit. So I think that the the playing field has been levelled on that is a good thing. So what were the rule changes just for anyone who hasn't heard? So the game week deadline has moved from an hour before the first fixture to an hour and a half before the first fixture. And that's right. essentially because... Um, we get team sheets an hour before the first fixtures, but um, the journalists get the team sheets an hour and 15 minutes before each fixture, which is why we was getting leaks yep. at quarter past 11 for yep. a half 11 deadline. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I make transfers on a Friday night and I'll be able to do that more comfortably now, knowing that it's a lot less likely that there's going to be any any team leaks before the deadline. Now, obviously, if... I don't have any wriggle room in funds and I've got an injury and there's an obvious transfer that I need to make. I mm-hmm. will make them. Um, I pr- that probably happens maybe like two or three times a season. And mm-hmm. it's something that I'm happier to do earlier on in the season as well. But like you look at the fixture calendar for this season, it, it's brutal. There's not really any free midweeks. And especially when you're looking at the teams involved in Europe, that they're basically playing every midweek as well as having a Premier League fixture every weekend. So there's so much that can change. Like literally every midweek up until Christmas, there's at least six sides that have got a fixture from one wow. game week to the next. That's every crazy. week. Like, and we, we don't know what the impact is going to be of the fact that there's, there was, everyone had three months off March to June. And mm-hmm. then we had Project Restart. Some teams were then in Europe. There's not really been any pre-season. We've got COVID to deal with, all of that stuff. Um, you know, someone could test positive with COVID on, on a Friday. And if yeah. you've made if you, you've made your two free transfers on the Monday or taken a hit on the Monday, you, you might find yourself in a hole. So, Yeah, that's a great show. Uh, this year, more than any other year, it'd be good to just wait, um, first of all, because we don't have those... Uh, those sneaky little uh, leaks, but then also because, you know, COVID's happening and we've got to prepare ourselves. And But, of course, if you have 0.0 in the bank Do and it. you can't wait for price rises, then you're saying, yeah, go for it. Yeah, That's a decent addition to the rules. I mean, that's better than all of your rules, Dave. Yeah, <laughs> you're number one, just like in your <laughs> mini league with your family. <laughs> <laughs> well, Holly, thank you very much for coming on and, and, and scolding all my rules. This is great. It was good fun. <laughs> Um, we agreed on a few of them. There's a few caveats added. Hopefully this has been helpful for listeners. And I just want to say again, thanks very much for having us in your uh, in your busy daily schedule. Thank you for having me. No worries. All right. We'll speak soon. Thank you very much. And uh, see you later. Bye.